It's a fascinating update. I don't personally see many teams that are currently under the spotlight suddenly getting away and getting out of the spotlight. I think that the same teams are going to struggle under these set of rules as they did under the previous set of rules. But it is going to change the focus, in my opinion, around what is a valuable asset and how much of the how many of the players in your squad are really pulling their weight relative to the absorption of your budget. And it might ideally, over time, bring in a deflationary concept into the Football League. With another day in the footballing world, another rule change that doesn't make much sense. More bureaucracy, more confusion, more supposition and hypothesis of movement towards a better world, a more sustainable future for football clubs across the footballing pyramid in the UK as the Premier League teams are set to vote in June to ratify an agreement that took place yesterday regarding yet another rule change and pivot in the world of financial fair play and profit and sustainability rules. We're going to take you through what we know so far of it, talk, talk you through a little bit of the background of what the rules were, why there's confusion, what the rules are in UEFA and the differences between the two and how the shift from one towards a closer representation of the other may look on paper like it's going to help certain clubs and hinder others, but in reality is much changing or are the rule changes essentially robbing Peter to pay Paul and are the concerns around the models at certain Premier League football clubs that are limiting and hindering their ability to comply with one set of rules going to be exactly the same set of concerns that will make them struggle to comply with a new set of rules. We're going to talk about it right now. If you're new to the channel, hit the like button if you enjoyed the video, but make sure you hit the subscribe button as well and drop a comment. Let me know your thoughts on the topic. Are you a fan of a specific club that is certainly under investigation at the moment, or are you worried about what might happen with your club? What about uh, for those people that support teams who are should be able to take advantage, who are free and clear of any suspected rule breaks now and are well positioned for the future. So guys, let's start by taking a swift look at a Sky Sports article that does its best to summarize some of the changes that are intended to take place. And it starts with Premier League's profitability and sustainability rules are to be replaced as early as this summer. The new system will be aligned with UEFA's squad cost ratio rules. New regulations will not affect the ongoing cases regarding Everton, Forest and Manchester City. Those regulations will eventually limit clubs participating in European competitions to only spend 70% of revenue on transfer fees, player wages, and so on. The Premier League has been looking at a model enabling clubs to spend up to 85% of revenue on squad cost with a sliding scale of penalties in place where clubs exceed that ratio. However, there is no guarantee that the new financial model will even be signed off at the league's annual general meeting in June. If approved, the new rules will not affect the ongoing cases regarding Everton, Forest and City, who will all continue to be judged on existing financial models. A Premier League statement on Monday read, at a Premier League shareholders meeting, clubs agreed to prioritise the swift development and implementation of a new league-wide financial system. This will provide certainty for clubs in relation to their future financial plans and will ensure the Premier League is able to retain its existing world-leading investment to all levels of the game. Just quick pause on that. Will it provide certainty? Wasn't the previous set of rules supposed to provide certainty? The rules are only clear unless they are changed. And what we are seeing increasingly at the Premier League highest level of decision making is a incredible frequency of moving the rules from one pillar to the next. It is beyond a joke. There's an inconsistency in the consistent application of any kind of rules around financial fair play, around the rules of the game, VAR, the offside trap, utilization of technology. No one can, in my opinion, say with a straight face that the rules are, consistency, are consistently applied. And if they are not, then how on God's green earth can they provide certainty for clubs? We will continue. Alongside this, Premier League clubs are also have also reconfirmed their commitment to securing a sustainably funded financial agreement with the EFL, subject to the new financial system being formally approved by clubs. The league and clubs have reaffirmed their ongoing and long-standing commitment to the wider game, which includes 1.6 billion distributed to all levels of football across the current three-year cycle. The Premier League's significant funding contributions cover all EFL clubs and National League clubs, as well as women and girls football and the grassroots of the game. It goes on to here to talk about Everton's 10-point deduction uh, for breaching the a previous set of rules under a previous set of guidelines around 
the uh, the reporting period. So as you, if you, if you are an Everton fan or if you follow the story, Everton obviously have uh, been charged with a 10-point deduction. It was reduced to six on appeal. They are also fu furious about the fact that they face a second indictment for this particular season because the rules, once again, as I said at the start, have already changed in the, re in the recent past from having a historical retrospective application after the reporting period of three years was complete to then making the rules be applied within the season of the potential breach. And that is why Everton faced the, the potential ramifications of two breaches for two separate reporting periods in the same season. And of course, if, and it was a big if, they can get themselves to a position where they are safe from relegation without the second set of points deductions, they may then find themselves back in the Premier League with a relegation zone at the end of the season after the initial points will be uh, deduction will be applied, they will then appeal that process. The appeal will that will not be held or heard, and the decision of which will not be granted or made until six days after the end of the season. I've already done a video on this. It's an absolute disgrace that no fan of any club that's in the relegation zone will be entirely clear of whether their club stays up or goes down on the final whistle of the final day of the season. It's a joke and yet more bureaucracy that is spoiling the game in every single way possible, in every department that they can put their oar in. It's ridiculous. Anyway, we'll continue. Everton was sanctioned by an independent commission uh, on November the 17th after having exceeded permitted losses of 19.5 over an assessment period for the 21-22 season. We've gone through that. Forest will also uh, have their, uh, their appeal heard. Forest should know what punishment they will face by April the 15th but could appeal against that decision. Again, similar to Everton, they will appeal, no doubt about it, and then they won't know the result of that appeal until after the season has finished. And by that time, everybody is either grown tired of knowing whether to celebrate or to commiserate their team's performance and what particular division they will be in for the next season. And not knowing that, that additional six or seven days, for what it's worth, offers an additional complication because there are the European Championships this summer. A lot of clubs will want to get their business done early. They want to know what their financial situation is. And in the case of Everton or Forest, or for that matter, teams like Luton, Sheffield United or Brentford and those that, that are all around that relegation zone, if they can't know for sure how much money they're going to receive in campaign prize money from where they finish in the Premier League, nor will they know exactly whether they're in the Premier League or in the Championship next season. Plus, they don't have the time to find in the, in the case or scenarios where they would want to be talking to international players who might be on European duty and have to get their business done and their accounts ready for next season's appraisals and auditing period by June the 30th, once again, the bureaucracy of this league is embarrassing. It's embarrassing, and I think that these guys need to have a long, hard look in the mirror and figure out a way to be clearer, conciser, and to stick to the plan, Batman. Whatever the rules are, at least give them a few years to see if they settle down and work out, and at least let teams know where they stand when the season finishes so they can make their appropriate plans for next season. We carry on. Despite the latest developments, no offer of increased funding for the English Football League. Look, we're going to skip past this in a nutshell. The English Football League, it's important that the Premier League distribute their some of their money into the footballing pyramid. Other European nations do not do it to the same uh, level as the as the English system does, and they have found themselves as a general kind of sweeping brush statement here in more trouble, more teams in the top divisions and lower divisions in, in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, and in France struggle financially than the, than the, the relative compa um, comparative teams in the, in the English division do because the footballing period in the UK is far more generous in its distribution of money. However... The argument from the Premier League clubs is, until we know what the rules are, how can Premier League clubs know and feel secure in their own financial standing before they can decide how much money of the pool to distribute to the clubs below them? They're trying to sort of look after their own shop first, talk their own book, and look after their own self-interest, which is only natural and understandable. And so part of these negotiations is hopefully to try and make sure that the secured funding for the footballing pyramid is reasonable but they won't ratify that until the rules are ratified and clear around how these clubs stand. And we're going to move on now to what those rules look like. In a nutshell, 
The proposal would work, which is closely aligned to UEFA spending rules, is that the Premier League clubs would only spend up to a maximum of 85% of your revenue on transfers and wages. That sounds like it could be fairer because at the moment we've got a system where you can't lose more than £105 million over a three-year period. Now, this might sound like a better system, but does it mean that going forward, the bigger clubs are always going to have more money to spend on transfer and transfers and wages? Because if you're only allowed to spend a limit of 85% of your revenue on players and wages, if your revenue is £700 million, you'll be able to spend £595 on players and wages. But if your revenue is only £100 million, you'll only be able to spend £85 million on players and wages. So I'm sure that will be something the Premier League clubs will look at. The rules as it currently stands, just to be really quick, as it's tapped on there, a three-year reporting period, clubs are only allowed to lose 105 million, so 35 million pound net per year, but it can be averaged out over a three-year ruling period. Clubs can only lose 15 million pound of their own money. They do have that wiggle room to lose that extra um, 90 million pound, but that 90 million pound has to come from secure funding, i.e. from the ownership putting the money in if those clubs fall a breach or a foul of the situation. The intended rules change would say, let's not focus on losses so much. Let's focus on making sure that whatever money you have, whatever money you generate as a club, your revenue, you can only spend a limit on that. And in UEFA, which is only relevant to teams that qualify for European tournaments, so the general top six and maybe teams like Brighton, West Ham, Newcastle, as they've got into it, they are are judged by the Premier League rules, but they also have to uh, make sure that they are in line with the UEFA rules as well. And so to a degree, most of the top six or seven clubs are already aligning to the UEFA rules, which are slightly stricter than the intended uh, changes from the Premier League rules. However, what I would say is if you remember, I did a video about this a little while ago. Can Chelsea actually afford to win the Carabao Cup? This was a, a, a an article from The Athletic. They interviewed Kieran Maguire, one of the biggest football finance kind of gurus and experts. I think he works for Manchester University, the professor up there. Brilliant, brilliant uh, insight into football. And he said, in a nutshell, the rules allow for a team to be able to pull out of Europe if they don't want to participate. And should Chelsea have won the, uh, the Carabao Cup final, they would have qualified for the Europa Conference League. And given their Premier League standing... They probably won't qualify for a healthier competition that in Europe next season that provides a, a juicier financial reimbursement for the efforts of playing in Europe. The financial compensation for even going all the way and winning the Europa Conference League is only about 13 or 14 million pounds, maybe 15 million pounds. And so with the additional costs involved, with the additional bonus structures that sure Chelsea players would have to receive if they were to qualify for Europe and win a cup, then... Is the juice worth the squeeze, especially when Chelsea's financial auditing would then have to face further scrutiny from a tighter set of restrictions than what the Premier League currently requires them to operate within? They didn't end up winning the cup, so it's kind of a moot point. But of course, if Chelsea do go on and win the FA Cup or if they qualify for the league by right, then they will have to adhere to stricter rules in UEFA in the UEFA competitions next year. It might be worth it with the additional prize money of qualifying for the Europa League rather than the Conference League, but the point is still valid. The Premier League are looking to shift to a situation where you can only spend 85% of your money. In the UEFA, comp in UEFA competitions, there's two major factors. One is you can only spend, at the moment, it's 90%. Next season, it's going to be 80%, so a slightly tighter than the intended Premier League shift. The season after, it will actually finalize its dilution down to 70% of the aggregated money that your club makes in revenue can be spent on the total of your wages annually, how much money you want to spend on transfers and annually, and your agent's fees. Now, what's interesting is you might think that this doesn't, the agent's fees thing is kind of irrelevant, but agent's fees is not often a conversation that we speak about very often when we're talking about transfer fees for salary or for, for players, big players moving to new teams. You think mainly about how much of the, or how much of the, of the budget is being spent on the transfer fee and how much is spent on wages. But actually, agents' fees do take up large slices, more so than you would probably imagine. In the case of Erling Haaland, uh, Alfie Inge Haaland could pick up around £25 million as he has helped represent his son. So I just want to quickly pivot for a split second here to show you a tweet from back in when the 2021 figures, 22 figures were first released that shows around Europe the clubs with the highest 
wages to turnover ratio. And of course, this number is pivotal because whatever this number is, as a percentage of your revenue, will di dictate how much money, how much gap, how much wiggle room within the revenue number is left and available for transfers. Paris Saint-Germain, at the time of reporting, had a wages to turnover ratio of 111%. Now, ultimately, getting players, people like um, Mbappe off the books are going to dramatically and drastically reduce that. Also, of course, uh, Lionel Messi's numbers, I think, might have been factored in at that particular time of reporting and won't be either, won't be any more either. So I'm sure that number has come down. But what you'll see quite clearly here is that teams like Everton and Newcastle United have massive headaches. And massive headaches exist for Everton under the current rules and massive headaches still exist and will exist under the future rules. And I want that to kind of this to be unequivocally clear that there's an argument and a suggestion that's going around the Twitter sphere that these new rules will mean that teams like Nottingham Forest and Everton who have fallen afoul of the, of the rules under the current system will not struggle in the old system. But what you can see from this particular Deloitte screenshot is that the same teams that will struggle under the current rules will likely struggle under the new rules. It is a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul because ultimately the restrictions in your ability to generate revenue for your club, compounded by the ambitions of an owner who wants to compete with the clubs who have higher revenues, result in overspending. And as you can see right now, the green line is the revenue of a football club. The blue line is the wages to revenue ratio. And you can see that the clubs that will be okay are the clubs that are already okay. Manchester City, they look like they're fine. Tottenham Hotspur look like they're fine. Arsenal to a degree. This is, again, on old data. Their revenue will be far higher next year, and so and Tottenham's will look different as well. But the teams that will struggle... Everton, 181 million pounds of revenue, 173 million pounds of wages. Newcastle United, 180 million pounds of revenue, 170 million pounds of wages. Brighton and Hove Albion, actually surprisingly high ratios. They still should be absolutely fine because their revenue will be generate will be going far higher thanks to their participation in Europe and and their higher league finishes over the last couple of seasons. But you take the point. Wolverhampton Wanderers, another team that has been suspected of getting close to the threshold of the current rules or under the new rules will also be a problem. Crystal Palace, another team that looks like they're going to struggle. Brentford is the only team who have managed to, at this particular point of, of reporting, of course, have, have very uh, small revenues relative to everybody else, but have also managed to keep their, their wage structure low. Chelsea, a team that you can see right here, 340 to 480. Now that will have changed dramatically in the last couple of seasons. And so my ultimate point, guys, from this is that the rules might be changing. The rules might be moving away from a situation of, uh, of not, not focusing on money lost, but focusing more on how you spend the money that you have and how much of it are you allowed to spend. But in reality, there is no difference. The same teams that struggle to create revenue are the same teams that spend too much relative to what they're what they're for. They're living beyond their means, credit card lifestyle. The teams that can generate revenue will have more wiggle room, more ability to lean into other teams that will need to sell their best players, not to raise money to stop their losses, but to get the wage structure down. There will be a pivot in the mindset. Teams that have significantly highly paid players who are not necessarily ge generating the value on the pitch will look to offload their players. Tottenham have looked to offload uh, Tangy and Dombele for the last three seasons. Haven't been able to do it, but we have been able to get rid of Hugo Lloris. Harry Kane, obviously, there's a massive value gap on the pitch stuff, but he has reduced the, the wage commitments. So Manchester United, another team with a player in Marcus Rashford who was on a high contract, then signed a new monster contract, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, around £350,000 a week. And his form has dropped this season to the point where a lot of Manchester United fans don't want him at the club anymore. And Manchester United might be forced to try to find a way to reduce that wage bill. As you can see, again, this data is out of date, but it's the most up-to-date complete data I can show you that Manchester United's wage structure at that particular point in time was 66%. Let's use that as a base mark. 66%, 71% in the case of Chelsea. If the rules allow you only to spend 85% of your total revenue on the combination of agents' fees, transfer fees, and salaries, 
then in the case of Chelsea, if that if the rules that will be applied were applied in this particular year, then Chelsea would only have 14% left of their revenue to be able to pay for a combination of other things, new signings, agents fees, and any new potential salaries. That's why there's going to be a, 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 a shift in focus, I think, around getting value. I think this will be a deflationary move around wages, which is important. I think it's a way for clubs to to try to prepare themselves for a new era and hopefully hopefully certain teams will be able to take advantage and other teams will have to pivot but like i say i think that teams like manchester united are going to struggle to find a buyer for a marcus rashford because marcus rashford is under no obligation to sacrifice his 350 grand a week salary just because the club don't want him anymore similar to tangy on the melee put your feet in the ground i'm not going you oh, you can loan me out but someone's paying me my full bit my full contract Manchester United are probably going to struggle to find a buyer to, to take Rashford's wages off. They might loan him out and someone else takes on 50% of the salary. But is that really making a dent? Manchester United will need to find ways, maybe, I'm not suggesting, for, for example, that Manchester United are under risk of PSR for what it's worth, uh, problems. But the, the shift in focus for me is not going to, to, to change too much. But what it is going to do is bring in under the spotlight how much are your top earners being paid and are they generating enough value and is there a way to go in a different direction, which is why you're seeing so many clubs right now pivot towards younger players where you're signing them uh, with high risk, obviously high, high return if they succeed, but obviously uh, most of them or a lot of them won't. But on that, you can buy players for cheap. You can buy players on cheaper wages, on long contracts. We've seen that with what Chelsea are trying to do. And hopefully... Some will make it. Some will generate value on the pitch that supersedes the the worth in their in their financial compensation. But those that don't work out can be sold on. They don't have overbearing salaries that other teams won't be able to take on if they do or don't work it out. And that is another way that that the clubs can generate revenue, which again can raise the number. If you sell players you don't need, you can generate revenue, which can raise the overall number, which then allows you to have more wiggle room in the cost centers of your salary and your agent's fees. It's a fascinating update. I don't personally see many teams that are currently under the spotlight suddenly getting away and getting out of the spotlight. I think that the same teams are going to struggle under these set of rules as they did under the previous set of rules, but it is going to change the focus, in my opinion, around what is a valuable asset and how much of the how many of the players in your squad are really pulling their weight relative to the absorption of your budget. And it might ideally, over time, bringing a deflationary concept into the Football League. We'll, we'll talk more about it as, it as it unfolds, guys. Like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know your thoughts. And as always, have a good day. Bye-bye.